Greetings all, F-Man here. Welcome back to Aceto Corsa, and welcome, better late than never, I suppose, to this, from our friends at Racim Studio, Formula RSS 2010 V8. This car has been out for quite some time, I am well aware. It first came to us on the 25th of February, 2024, and as of the date of recording, it is currently the 5th of October, 2024. So, yeah, this car has been out for the much better part of a year at this point, and I have, yes, neglected to make an official review video of it until this moment before us. Believe it or not, despite my ineptitude in getting a review made of this car, this actually was one that was very highly anticipated by yours truly, and I was even involved to some extent anyway in the development and initial testing of it before release. And of course, that was a very cool experience and one for which I am very grateful to Race Sim Studio for entrusting me with that top secret at the time information. It's an awful lot of fun. I hope to be able to throw some input into some future projects for Forthcoming. However, this car, Formula RSS 2010 V8, it's been out since February of 2024, and that's about it. It has not made great waves in the Aceto Corsa open wheel community. Yes, of course, people are aware of it. Yes, of course, we drive it. Yes, of course, we love it. But it's not the car that tends to be gracing the screens of the tubes of you very frequently particularly the tubes of you produced by certain very prominent YouTubers turned racing drivers, Jimmy Rodman, who will much more readily feature another race sim studio car, Formula RSS 2013 V8. This car is a 2010 type Formula One type car. Formula RSS 2013 V8 is a 2013 type Formula One type car. In 2010, the Real World Formula One World Championship started a set of regulations that carried it all the way through the end of the 2013 season, meaning that a car that you see in 2010 is really not too substantially different from a car that you see in 2013. Race Sim Studios' production of cars of this type started with the 2013 car, and now it's culminated here in the 2010 car. The initial strike power is something that's very important in the world of sim racing modding, as we have seen in more recent years with current era Formula One type machinery, but Race Sim Studio were first to market their 2013 car. That was several years ago at this point, and of course that one took full advantage of being the first type of this overall car that Race Sim Studio produced, and therefore it got all the hype, it got all the publicity, and it got all of the people trying to make YouTube videos on day one publicizing the release. This one comes around earlier this year, and despite it being really, I would say at this point, the flagship of the RSS Classics line, these are the products and the projects that Race Sim Studio take on largely out of passion for motorsport and passion for the real world subject matters that these cars more or less intend to emulate with some differences, of course. But this car, it is one of the most highly detailed modifications for a Sido Corsa that Race Sim Studio have ever made and that anybody really has ever made there being. We've got ourselves 472,205 triangles comprising 208 objects. This is right up there with the most highly detailed 3D models that Race Sim Studio have ever brought to market and all of the features that you will see just in terms of the modeling on this car, both the static stuff that you can see readily and some of the dynamic stuff that you'll see later on, particularly on replay camera views. No expense has been spared, they thought of everything, they optimized it, they implemented it, and they brought it to market, and it works fantastically well in every situation you find this car. We also have some electronic goodies to play with on this car, some of which were groundbreaking for Race Sim Studios catalog. Regardless, though, this is not the car that you see gracing your YouTube screens all that often. And case in point, even though I was involved in testing this one prior to release, even though I knew about it for quite some time before that, and I was greatly anticipating it, it's taken me until October to release a review on a car that was released to the world in February. I suppose this video is not necessarily only having as its objective to review this car, which of course we will do, but I also endeavor to explain, potentially, why this one has fallen short 
in terms of the expectations that I certainly had of its overall reception and overall publicity because this car is still far and away outperformed in media by its 2013 counterpart, even though I believe this car is superior in every way, aesthetically, audio, physics, and features, and I'll show you why that is as well, it's just kind of reached the market at a time when perhaps the love for this generation of Formula One type car was waning a bit, and even though it is a technical tour de force in every aspect, it's just not quite there in terms of the publicity. It's fallen well short of expectations, I would say. However, that does not change my overall impression that this is one of the finest products ever brought out by RaceSim Studio, therefore one of the finest products ever to grace our Aceto Corsa setups, and certainly it can offer some of the finest driving experiences you could ever hope to have in sim racing. What then is this car? Well, in keeping with other examples from the RSS Classics line, this is not a ground-up interpretation of a Formula One type car from a given year. No, this one is meant to be a bit more faithful in terms of reproducing and emulating a real-world car. The subject matter for this one is, of course, the Ferrari F10, which was the Formula One car with which Ferrari disputed the 2010 Formula One World Championship. It's not meant to be millimeter per millimeter an F10, because it's not an F10. Of course, it is a Formula RSS 2010 V8. However, near as makes no difference, we can look at some of the specifications here on the Ferrari F10 and get a sense of what it is that we're working with. Those of you who know what the cars were in this era, well, all of this is just going to be academic for you. But those of you who don't know, this is what we've got under the skin. We have got ourselves a carbon fiber honeycomb composite monocoque. This is 2010's Formula One after all, which means we've got carbon composites everywhere in terms of the car construction, in terms of the chassis, suspension, brakes, and even some of the mechanical components by this point, such as gearbox casing, and sometimes even the gears themselves can be at least partially carbon. Obviously, we have got carbon bodywork covering all of those things. We've got carbon wings. We've got carbon nose cones and crash structures at the back bolted to what's probably a carbon gearbox casing. So, yeah, this is the world of carbon composites, and it's still largely indicative of what we have in Formula One in current year. However, that's where the similarities end. This car was the last of the Formula One cars not to feature the very prominent but also very controversial DRS system, the drag reduction system. That is the movable slot gap upper flap on the rear wings that enables the drivers to push button and receive overtake in an entirely artificial and antithetical to racing manner. However, what this car does feature though, and though this was not the first of the Formula One cars to feature this, it was one of the ones that copied it very prolifically, it features what we called an F-duct, named for the system that we first saw on the McLaren MP425 that year in preseason testing, where we had a duct that was interfacing with the rear wing adjacent to the letter F in one of its sponsor logos, but this car has an F duct, which is an aerodynamic fluidic switch which stalls the rear wing, decreasing rear downforce, but also decreasing drag down the straights. And this was the genesis of DRS in the way that we now know it. But a completely passive system, driver actuated via physically blocking an aerodynamic duct in the cockpit, and Racing Studio, believe it or not, have actually emulated that in its functionality and its visual effects in terms of the driver moving to actuate that system. We'll get into that much later, but those are the things that these cars are known for. The other technical things that these cars are known for. 2010 was the first time since 1993 that Formula One had prohibited in-race refueling, meaning that the cars had to start the race with all of the fuel that they anticipated to use during the entire race distance. Therefore, these cars had to grow a bit in terms of their wheelbase. We still had an overall track dimension of 1800 millimeters. That was homologated in the technical regulations, but the wheelbase, as in the distance between the front and rear axle center lines, that had to increase. The cars needed to get a bit longer to accommodate larger fuel tanks. So that's something that we started to see in 2010, and that continued all the way through the end of the 2013 season in this engine formula. Speaking of the engines in this era, what did we have in these cars? All the cars were running 2.4 liter V8s, naturally aspirated of course, 
in the Ferrari F10, that would have been the Tipo 056, the type 056-2010. It's a 2.4 liter V8. It was producing about 750 horsepower, although Race Sim Studio, via their stats in Content Manager, say that this particular one is producing 777 horsepower from that 2.4 liter V8 at 90 degrees bank angle. 324 newton meters of torque as well coming out of that engine at the crankshaft. So we've got ourselves a lot of performance potential here, particularly when you consider that this car here is weighing 621 kilograms with the driver. So 777 horsepower, 621 kilograms, that gives us a power to weight ratio of 0 0.08 kilograms per horsepower. So definitely got ourselves quite a lot of performance potential here. This car, as well as its real-world, more or less counterpart, the Ferrari F10, it features a 7-speed plus reverse semi-automatic paddle shift gearbox, so 7 forward ratios. We've got neutral, of course, in between all of them, and then we've got a reverse gear, which hopefully you never have to use, but it's there. It's an electronically controlled, hydraulically actuated sequential gearbox. It can change gear more or less instantaneously. The regulations of this era, as well as of today, mandate that there be a measurable physical break in torque transfer from the engine to the driven axle, and therefore that's when your gear shift is occurring, but that gear shift is occurring within milliseconds to the point where it's effectively seamless, to the point where the driver can barely even feel the gear change happening. The only indication that the gear change has happened, and you'll see this later on as we drive the car, is the engine sounds different because the res have dropped between ratios and you're continuing to accelerate at basically maximum torque. So the gearbox is being a gearbox. The actual car obviously used actual fuel. For the Ferraris of this era, that was being provided by Shell in their V-Power brand. They were also being supplied lubricants for the engine as well as a gearbox and other systems by Shell in their Helix brand and the tires in this era. Controlled tires in Formula One going back to the 2007 season, but for 2009, Bridgestone were tasked with bringing a slick compound back into Formula One. Prior to that, we had four longitudinal grooves cut into the tires to limit cornering speeds, but for 2009, Bridgestone brought back slicks, and that was continued for 2010 with some slight modifications made, particularly to the width of the tires on the front axle, but Bridgestone tires around 13-inch wheels in this era on all of the cars. You can see that we have got ourselves bonged tires here. Bonged smolder for the branding here from Race Sim Studio. That's always a bit cheeky, but I definitely appreciate that. And that's continuing a trend that started with the first release from the Race Sim Studio Classics line of Formula RSS 2000 V10. That one ran on bonged tires as well, although with grooves on it. That's really cool. Real world competition history though for this car's analog, the Ferrari F10. It was driven by Felipe Massa and Fernando Alonso for the duration of the 2010 World Championship, making its race debut at the 2010 Bahrain Grand Prix, which it also won. It took its final Grand Prix victory at the 2010 Korean Grand Prix. Remember that, the Yungam circuit? Yeah me neither. The last event that I participated in was the last event of the 2010 championship, the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, meaning that it started 19 races, it took 5 victories, 15 podium positions, 2 pole positions, and 5 fastest laps. It was not enough to win the drivers or constructors championships, which went to Sebastian Vettel and Red Bull respectively. However, it was enough to launch some memes on the internet of Fernando Alonso being stuck behind Vitaly Petrov for the duration of the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, and effectively killing his championship hopes there. Bye. But that's what we've got blending the stats available to us here from Race Sim Studio and Content Manager as well as some real world stats that this car's real world analog would have exhibited. But what do we have before us here in showroom view? Well, this is where we can start to get carried away with some of the things that we can see. First off, we mentioned that we've got 472 some odd thousand polygons in this model. And they've all been handcrafted and they've all been optimized as well because the performance that you get from this thing just graphically is tremendous. Obviously, we're showing a static image right now on my screen, but I've got my screen recorder going, I've got audio going, I am pulling over 840 frames per second right now, so that's really cool. However, what we've got in front of us 
you have got something that is just polished and finished like very few Assetto Corsa mods are polished and or finished and of course that's what Race Sim Studio do day in and day out. You can see here this front wing. Some of the details on it may be a little bit difficult to see simply because it's white on white, but it is very indicative of the front wing treatments that we got in this era of Formula One. 2009 had a very radical regulation shift. Gone were the spaceship type cars of 2006 to 2008. Lots of topside aerodynamic appendages uh, generating downforce from the top down. Here in 2009 and 2010, we started to try to generate downforce with the under tray, and we'll get into that a little bit later on as well, but not nearly to the extent that we saw starting in 2022 with proper ground effect aerodynamics. We had some of that going on in this era, but for the most part, these were simply chopped down versions of a 2008 car and stretched a little bit to accommodate the larger fuel tank. But one of the more radical changes that we made in this era to the regulation set was our front and rear wings. These front wings are much lower and much wider than they were in 2008, and the rear wings are much higher and much narrower than they were in 2008. We'll talk about that rear wing in a bit as well. But this front wing here, you can see that we have got a center section of the wing. This is, I believe, 300 millimeters, where it's just a neutral section. The FIA have specified the height of this section of the wing, and they've also specified that you're not allowed to have any downforce generation components in this section here, 150 millimeters to either side of the nose cone center line. So that's what we're accommodating here. However, the moment we get beyond 150 millimeters, you can see we start to play with flaps and cascade elements, and we start to shape that main plane itself. It all merges outboard into an end fence here, which is very highly sculpted with its own little barge board turning vane inset amid the rest of the end fence proper. We've got an inverted U-channel, which is a vortex generator. We have got one, two flap elements here coming off of the main plane, and then we have got an additional third flap element with its own end fences coming off of the end fence proper inboard. That's really cool. Obviously, that's symmetrical on this side as well. Modeling details that you see here, we have got fasteners, we've got struts, these are stays just to keep the uh, upper elements of the wing from flexing too much. And then of course here on the outboard side, the sunlit side, we've got fastener details holding those flap elements in structurally. We've got wonderful carbon texturing here with the gloss sealing that carbon layup. That's glorious detail right there, I've got to say. Continuing outboard here, just looking at the wheels. Something that you would have seen on the 2010 Formula One cars, and really this is something that goes back to 2007 when they started to play with these wheel fairings that were, technically speaking, part of the brake duct as far as the regulations were concerned, but practically they were part of the wheel rim, a separate element. They had these fairings, these extractor fairings, over the wheel rims, the wheels proper, and that was to help outwash. In other words, we want to extract that hot air from the brakes for brake cooling, but we also want to generate outwash so that we can get this turbulent hot air away from the car and get better aerodynamics so that we can get ourselves some better downforce later on with our aero appendages. They continued to do things like this to an extent in 2010. Eventually these would be banned, but in the interim, what we had here is this dish design. You can see we've got these two concentric rings one wider than the other around the wheel nut. And that's trying to claw back some of the benefits that the wheel fairings, these removable discs that the teams would have been placing in these uh, wheel hubs, and they would have been retained on the wheel gun for pit stops. But they're trying to retain some of the aerodynamic benefit that they had gotten from their 2007-2008 designs here on a 2010 design. So that's what you've got here. But unlike the previous generation of designs through 2009, these are cast into the wheel itself. So these come off with the wheel because it's part of the wheel. So in the pit stops, this would all come off along with the wheel, along with the tire, and then a new wheel and tire with this setup would come on, and that would be the same. Of course, they would have to be identical uh, between the sets of wheels because the FIA would probably take a dim view on them changing components like that in a pit stop, but that is what they did. Eventually things like these would be banned outright for the 2011 season. Additionally though, what you can see here, we have got our bonged tires. We've got some great detail here. Made in Japan, Bridgestone of course being a Japanese company, so this is what they are uh, intending to emulate. That's cool. 
We've got 245, 55, R13, that makes sense to me. So 245 is going to be your tread patch, your contact patch. 55 is going to be your thickness from the bead on the wheel rim out to the tread, and then R13 is your uh, diameter there. Cool, makes sense. Tubeless, nice, and then we've got some chalk marks on the tire as well. Very nice. You'll also see this green band around the outer uh, sidewall of the tire. This is something that the FIA started to float in 2008 at the Japanese Grand Prix, which was held at Fuji that year. That was a publicity thing, trying to make people believe that they care about the environment. That was retained through 2009 on the softer compound tires, and that continued through 2010 here. So the softer compounds have these green stripes around them. So that's something interesting. Going back to the car proper though, we can see our front wing and how it is secured to the nose cone via these two long pylons. We have a high nose on a Formula One car. That's something that we really need to see again because the high nose cars look very good and they're much more efficient aerodynamically. The FIA since about this era and particularly starting in 2014 when we had to feature the Schlangschnaz, as I started to call it, um, <laughs> they wanted to lower the nose hip, nose tips because they thought that uh, there might be a remote chance in hell that a t-bone accident could penetrate the cockpit never happened never would happen it was ridiculous but they banned the high nose for that reason and to this day formula one cars do not have high noses bring them back you're crazy if you think this is dangerous but that's what we had in this era and because you want to maximize the airflow underneath the car you want the nose to be as high as possible but you also need to secure the front wing, which you want to be as low as possible, because the lower you can run a wing to the ground, the more efficient it's going to be at funneling air underneath and creating negative pressure underneath, in other words, downforce. So you mount the wing as low as you can, and you get it as far away from the nose tip as you can via these long pylons. This is something that Terrell debuted in the 1990 season, and we still saw it all the way up through 2013. Very cool, and of course Race Sim Studio doing their job to emulate that as well as they can. We've got ourselves these fasteners here, which seem to be taped over for a minuscule aerodynamic benefit, but that's <laughs> what these teams were doing, so there you go. And then underneath the car you have these preliminary barge boards starting to persuade the airflow that's coming through these front wing pylons underneath the monocoque. You're going to start to bifurcate that flow so that you can have it interface with this. This is the tongue or tea tray. And this is the forwardmost point of the floor. This is a strut to secure this section of the floor to the monocoque so that it doesn't flex so much. But what you'll start to see the air doing here is being bifurcated to either side. These barge boards push the air outboard. Some of it interfaces here on this edge of this turning vane coming down from the wing mirror where it's now going to be just blown out the side of the car. Some of it's going to interface with the barge board on this face where it will be steered by the inboard face of this turning vane and then be steered along the top edge of the floor as, long, as well as the side of the floor here to seal the under tray and therefore start to generate some crude ground effect. But the air will come around the side pods here which are undercut very sharply to attach that flow and then it will be entrained to the top of the diffuser where it's accelerated over top. However, uh, some other things happen here. What's this? This is the exhaust. Yeah. <laughs> the rear zones of these cars are very complicated because there's a lot going on back here. Yes, we have just the ambient airflow being energized by the speed of the car. However, once you get to this point, you've got an engine pulling 18,000 RPM here at its red limit, which uh, was homologated in the regulations as well. These were the same engines, more or less, that you saw in 2006 exceeding 20,000 RPM, but the FIA said, no, that's too much fun. We have to ban that. So 18,000 RPM became the homologated rev, lim rev limit for 2009, and that continued through the end of the V8 era in 2013. But that engine is exhausting here, which means that your ambient flow is merging with your exhaust flow, which is then going to energize the ambient flow more over top of the diffuser and over here out the side and over here toward the tire. Basically, you've got high pressure, high speed flow sealing this hole in the floor so that the tire wake can be minimized and therefore the tire generated drag can be minimized and therefore top speed can be maximized. So that's what you've got going on there. 
The under tray is all well in bid though. What do we have top side? Well, going back to our front end, oops, there we go. Going back to our front end, you can see where our front wing is. And we talked about the overall geometry and presence of that front wing and why it looks the way it does. However, what we've got going on here at the nose tip, what do you see here? Well, we've got ourselves this mesh work behind this void, this hole in the nose tip. Two-fold purpose to this. Number one, we've got ourselves cockpit cooling, so there's a duct that will uh, file all the way through the nose and then through the monocoque and then into the cockpit. But the other thing that this duct is doing, in addition to another little thing underneath the nose, if we can see through here, not quite. However, what we've got going on here with this duct is twofold. One is the driver cooling in the cockpit. However, this is also feeding the F duct that we talked about prior. So as the air goes through the nose tip, it joins up with the monocoque here with our quick release fasteners that you would see the mechanics using in the pit stops if they have to do a nose change into the monocoque proper. You'll also see here inset into both the nose tip as well as the top of the monocoque, we have got this U channel. This is very similar in its overall rationale to what the inverted U channels on the bottoms of the end fences of the front wing are doing. We're just trying to steer air toward the cockpit area here and maybe to help it to create a little bit of negative pressure so that we don't uh, have the driver interfere so much with the airflow heading into the air intake here, the snorkel. However, once we do get up to the cockpit, we have got this almost comical little windscreen here that Formula One cars still have, and we've got one here on F2010 from RSS, as we should have. But we come into the cockpit, an open cockpit, as an open wheeler should have. We've got ourselves the cockpit surround, as you would expect to see. And then, of course, we have got our intake snorkel here for the engine. Naturally aspirated engine, so we are intaking all of our inlet charge from the top of the engine through a big plenum, which is then feeding eight butterflies, in this case, for the V8 engine. However, other things that you can't see here because we don't have a driver in the cockpit is obviously the driver be wearing a helmet. He's going to have a little winglet on his helmet as well. That's twofold. Number one, we're going to try to cut down on the lift, the aerodynamic lift that's created by this high speed airstream over his head. And that could cause a lot of problems for his neck later on. But also we're going to try and smooth out the airflow so that we don't get buffeting of the driver's helmet because if you've ever seen a sphere in a wind tunnel the air spills off to one side and then it spills off to the other side and it alternates rapidly and that um, oscillation increases as the airspeed increases so that can also get very annoying with that buffeting on the helmet so winglet will reduce that reduce the lift as well as smooth the airflow so that the engine is getting rather laminar flow for its inlet charge so that's cool Coming around the back of the cockpit surround, there's the cushion, just to stop the driver's head from banging into the back of the monocoque like so. And then we have these louvers here in this little open U channel. You can see where we are coming from. This is the obviously the front end of the car. We've got our wing mirrors here. Initially, there would have been a slightly different design on the F10. The wing mirrors would have been mounted here on top of these turning vanes, which we talked about with uh, relation to the under tray and the top of the floor. But the FIA later said later on in 2010, nope, you've got to put your wing mirrors here to the sides of the cockpit because they said that the driver being in this position can look here, but can't look there bureaucracy. <laughs> However, that's what we're dealing with. You've got these louvers here though. This is for cooling some of the electronics boxes underneath the driver's seat. It's also just for venting some of the hot air from around the fuel tank. No curs on these 2010 cars. It was allowed in the technical regulations in 2010, but it was effectively a gentleman's agreement among all the F1 teams not to use curs. That's the kinetic energy recovery system during the 2010 season because it was something that not all the teams were able to adopt in 2009 because of budget constraints and that was not going to be changing for the 2010 season so the teams came to an agreement and said nobody's going to run curs in 2010 so they didn't be that as it may though some of the louvers and other cooling appendages that we now see in 2024 in this section of the car for cooling things like the the high capacity high charge and discharge rate battery packs that support the much bolstered hybrid systems on the modern cars 
we started to see that in this era too, so that's what this is about. But it's not cooling batteries in this case, it's cooling some electronics and it's also venting some air around the fuel tank as well, but that's what we've got. Otherwise, top side across the engine cover, very quiet. Unlike, say, a 2007-2008 car where you'd have chimneys and other turning vanes in this section, it's very quiet, just clean, curved, sculpted bodywork curving down toward the suspension wishbone here on the rear zone of the car. Double wishbone push rod front and rear suspension on this car in case you didn't notice. But you'll notice here we do not have engine exhausts. The engine exhausts are coming down bottom side blowing the diffuser on this car. Once again Red Bull did not invent the blown diffuser in 2011. However coming back up toward the rear wing we've got ourselves these two struts supporting the rear wing purely structural because there's no such thing as DRS. We've got ourselves our gearbox casing, which is mostly carbon. You can see the suspension elements mounting to the gearbox casing. There's our half shaft out the differential, bringing drive to the rear axle. And then we've got ourselves our rear crash structure, our monkey seat winglet, some high pressure air bleeding off from the engine cover, center line blowing this monkey seat winglet, and then our rear crash structure with our rain light, as you can see. Very, very nice. The after portion of the diffuser, there we go. We have got our strakes underneath the diffuser. And then we have got our central tunnel section. This is more or less an example of what we would have called the double diffuser in 2009. Remember in that season we had Braun Williams and Toyota debut a loophole in the regulations regarding the design of the diffuser as it related to the starter hole. Remember, these Formula One cars in this era were not capable of self-starting. They had to be started exclusively from an external motor that the mechanics would stick onto the back of the gearbox in the pits. However, you needed a hole in the back of the bodywork in order to access the lay shaft on the gearbox to get that motor in there to turn the engine over. But there weren't quite regulations that were strong enough in stipulating the dimensions of that hole. So therefore, if you could put this big old hole down the middle of the diffuser, the teams would very happily argue, oh yeah, that's how we could start the engine. And the fact that we're able to funnel billions of tons of air through here and thereby generate more downforce is just a, it's a funny little side effect. Isn't that amazing how that happens? So, yeah, eventually, these double and even triple-decker diffusers, if you want to count this little horn section through the top of the diffuser or around the bottom side of the rear crash structure, perhaps this is a triple-decker diffuser after all, uh, eventually the FIA said, uh, no. Stop doing this, please. And once again, the fun police prevailed. But for, tw for 2010 and 2009, as we initially saw, this is what the teams were trying to do. Interestingly enough, Adrian knew he didn't think to do this, but he later had to play catch up. And of course, they duly won the Constructors Championship over there at Red Bull for 2010. But I digress. We have a beam wing as well here in addition to the monkey seat. So this is this lower element of the rear wing between the end fences and then the rear wing proper. We've got this main plane and then the upper flap. Big end fences there with the louvers bleeding out that high pressure air outboard. But then you've got this. Obviously we've got the engine cover. We've got a shark fin. But the shark fin carries all the way through to the upper flap on the rear wing, and then it's actually joined to that upper flap. Can we sort of glitch through the bodywork? Yeah. That duct is joined to the rear wing on all sides. I call it a duct because it is a duct. This is the F duct, ladies and gentlemen. This is the magical mystical device that stalls the rear wing when the driver actuates a fluidic switch via his left hand covering this hole in the cockpit. This feeds a duct which carries all the way through the monocoque out to the engine cover fed more by ambient air bleeding around the camera mount and around the snorkel into this section here and then it carries all the way through to the rear wing where it blows through the top of the flap exhausting here around this strut. What it does is it creates a little bit of aerodynamic interference relative to the downforce that this wing is producing just by virtue of its location in a high-speed airstream and when that flow through this duct interferes with the flow over this wing as it is, it creates a stalling effect. The rear wing is still generating downforce, of course, but not generating quite as much downforce as it once was, and of course, downforce and drag square with speed. So if you can reduce that downforce generation, you can reduce the drag generation, meaning that you can increase your straight line speed. And that's the rationale of this F duct. You could generate a little bit less drag and a little bit less downforce 
down straights, meaning you can get a little bit more top speed, meaning you can get a little bit more of an advantage on the guy in front of you if his car doesn't have a similar system, as McLaren originally did at the beginning of 2010. Eventually, most of the other teams, at least toward the front of the grid, were able to implement their own version of what came to be called the F-Duct. However, the FIA, once again being the fun police, said that the most skilled racing drivers on the planet couldn't possibly take their hand off of the steering wheel, so we need to ban that. However, they did, in a rare moment of rationality from the FIA, say, you know, this is actually a good idea and we like what it can do in terms of improving overtaking opportunities, so we're going to do something even crazier and allow movable aerodynamic devices for 2011. That became the drag reduction system, DRS, which we still see on Formula One cars to this day. Started with this rather crude and completely analog manual system called the F-Duct in 2010. Really cool. And Race Sim Studio, of course, have made this operable, which we'll get into when we drive the car. This side of the bodywork, though. Here we go, rear axle, you can see double wishbone push rod rear suspension, big brake ducts feeding into the wheel hubs as you can see. No wheel fairings here on the rear wheels, but you do have this inset of the uh, central spokes there. Very cool. Comparing that to the front wheels where you see these concentric rings around the wheel nut as we talked about, so that's a bit different of course. However, the big thing that you're going to see later on as we're driving the car is inside the cockpit. Therefore, let's go inside the cockpit. We are sitting just a little bit off center and our field of view isn't quite right, but generally this is the uh, overall picture that you're going to get from inside the cockpit. Everything, of course, is turned off, but we're going to have a display on this steering wheel. Of course, it's a bit lower tech compared to what we're used to seeing nowadays, where we've got these LCD screens that are actually GUI interfaces for the most part, but here you've got a gear position indicator in the center. We're going to have uh, several different parameters that we can monitor on the steering wheel via Lewis script, which is actually kind of cool, and as far as I'm aware, a first for a Race Sim Studio product, particularly of this caliber, so we'll go through that a little bit. But lots of information still available on this steering wheel. Of course, this has also had the driver interfaces with pretty much all the major controls on the car, your gear shift, your engine map, your fuel mixture, things like that. So that's cool. Otherwise, in the cockpit, it's fairly spartan as you would expect from a top level open wheeler, as you would expect, but there it is, the RSS chassis plate, RSS 2010 season, car 10, chassis V8-10, signature there, signed off, very, very cool, and the chassis plate manufactured by RSS, Automobili London UK, Formula 2010, very much like the RSS chassis plate. There is the lever for what is probably the um, I'm not entirely sure what this lever would be for. Maybe it's brake bias, maybe it's an anti-roll bar adjustment, whatever it is, because this is the uh, valve for brake bias adjustment. Maybe a roll bar sort of thing, but here we go. Anyway, we have got our ignition switch here on the right-hand side of the bulkhead, and then some more ancillary controls here for the radio, rain light, heat advisor switch, things like that. So par for the course, early 2010s uh, Formula One car stuff. I like it an awful lot. Also down here, I mentioned off the top that I had a small part in the development and testing phase of this car. Well, I was contacted by Racim Studios' chief modeler shortly before the release and was like, hey, uh, do you want to put anything on the car? So I uh, very crudely put up my F-Man signature and my number 47, and I sent that off to him via Discord, and this showed up on the driver's seat. So when you're driving this car, I believe all the skins that come with it stock, you are sitting on my signature, or at least my public signature that I want to show you on the internet. No, I don't sign actual documents as F-Man, but here it will suffice, and of course, very, very cool sort of thing to have my YouTube name and my handwriting on a Racium Studio product, so very much appreciate that. Other things that we'll see in the cockpit, obviously we've got our seat, it is done in carbon and then it's covered in Alcantara, suede, whatever you want to call it. Seat belts with the central hub, the quick release fastener there, and our shoulder belts as well. Very nicely done. Beyond that, down here in the footwell, throttle and brake, no clutch pedal because we have a paddle actuated clutch on the steering wheel. And our steering column going down the middle. This uh, earthy leather color. This is padding just to stop the driver's legs from bouncing around too badly in here. And then the steering wheel itself, 
very nice carbon finish. Those of you who have the Ferrari F-150 Thrustmaster wheel rim, yeah, you're very familiar with this steering wheel. This is more or less the same. That steering wheel from Thrustmaster is emulating the 2011 Ferrari design. This one is more or less emulating the 2010 Ferrari design. So basically the same thing, very authentic looking. On the back of the steering wheel, we've got ourselves some great detail here. RSS 877 4 slash 2 Volante Formula 2010. Volante is Italian or Spanish for steering wheel. Very cool with some code designations underneath. Replace every five year. Yep, makes sense. So in other words, we need to have replaced this almost three times <laughs> coming into this. So cool. Beyond that, quick release fastener on the steering column for quick removal of the steering wheel. Gear shift paddles on top and then clutch paddles on the bottom. Unlike a modern Formula One steering wheel where we just have one clutch paddle on one side or the other, depending on the driver's preference, we've got two of them here and they duplicate each other in function. Gear shift on either side, up on the right, down on the left, or it can be a rocker switch where you can push the right side paddle for a downshift or push the left side paddle for an upshift, whatever you want to do. Uh, sometimes the drivers prefer to do it that way depending on what's going on, but really, really nice nonetheless. Toward the uh, top side of the car, there's our T-bar camera mount with our camera lens in there. We've got a couple over-the-shoulder camera views on either side with camera lenses in there. Camera lenses looking uh, rearward as well from our T-bar. That's nice. Very, very cool. Also, as we're out on track, you're going to see a couple of things, particularly in the replay views at the end of the hot laps. Uh, you're going to see that the front wing flexes very realistically with aerodynamic load. It's not just a preloaded animation that happens over bumps or whatever. You will see that wing flexing with the airspeed as it increases and decreases. And of course, um, heave moments, very uh, sharp vertical shock will also cause the wing to flex as well. So that's cool. The rear wing does the same thing as do the edges of the floor along the flanks of the car as well as the uh, back of the diffuser. You'll also see flexing per, um, particularly in high speed corners of that shark fin integrating the F duct. So that's really, really cool. Some great details on this car in terms of the dynamic modeling as well. So great things to see all around. However, it drives even better than it looks. And we're going to be doing that very shortly. Stand by. Welcome to Mugello. Before we get out on track though, let's take a look at, first of all, how wonderful this car looks now loaded up in game, not in the wonderful but not quite realistic confines of showroom view. And now we've got the thing under actual dynamic loads with gravity, with its own weight, with fuel on board, and of course all the ambient lighting effects. It looks utterly fantastic here, as it did in showroom. Everything that you saw there is still here, as you would well expect, and it looks absolutely fantastic. Now we've got our driver inside here. This is the newer bespoke RSS driver that we first started to see on cars like Formula Supreme in 2022. But there we are. He's in the cockpit, nestled snugly away. Let's take a look, though, at the setup screen and see what we've got going on here. First of all, the gear screen. We have got our gear ratios, first through seventh in the forward gears, plus the final drive ratio. Adjustable to your heart's content, as you can see, default values are shown here. Tires. We've got a menagerie of tire compounds to choose from. It defaults to soft. We can select super soft, soft, medium, and hard, as you can see. The soft and super soft compounds have that green stripe around the sidewalls that we mentioned in showroom. When you select the medium compound, that goes away. Same with the hard. You also have intermediate and wet compounds available if you're into that sort of thing with your CSP setup. Tire pressures default to 16 PSI in the front and 15 PSI in the rear. Range of adjustment front and rear is 15 to 26. And of course, you'll be able to make those adjustments depending on what your setup demands and what track conditions demand. Fuel, we default to 50 liters here. However, that can be completely drained at zero, but maximum fuel capacity is 220 liters. So just make sure that you keep in mind what your uh, fuel needs are going to be for, for your run because you're not allowed to refuel during the race. 
Also, we have got engine map available here on the fuel screen. Defaults to one, which is max power. However, you can adjust this from steps one all the way down to step 12, which is the lowest power setting. And you can also adjust that from the cockpit. We'll get into that a little bit later on. Aerodynamics, you just have your range of adjustment for your front and rear wing. They both default to 16. The front wing goes down to step one, if you wish, and all the way up to step 20. The rear wing goes down to step one and all the way up to step 20 as well, so keep that in mind. You do not visually see any changes in the angle of attack on the front or rear wings, but the effects, of course, are duly modeled. Brakes, we have got brake bias and brake power, as you would expect, but we also can adjust the sizes of the front and rear brake ducts. They um, go up from steps zero to two, so three ranges of adjustment in total really cool. Obviously, the larger your brake duct is, the more brake cooling you're going to get. Lower value means that the brakes will run cooler, but top speed is affected. So, obviously, the lower value you've got, you will run the brakes cooler, but you're generating more drag, so you might want to crank up some of these variables here if you're concerned about straight line speed. Drivetrain, differential adjustments here in power, coast, and preload. Default values are shown. Force feedback, this is just the FFB linearity. We see this a lot in Assetto Corsa. Suspension, camber and toe on all four corners with default values shown. The suspension screen number two, the main, this is where you are adjusting things like bump stop stiffnesses, travel ranges, wheel rates, and ride heights on all four corners. Default value is shown, obviously. Got to be careful with the ride heights there because if you get them too low, particularly if the car is full of fuel at the beginning of a run, well, you're going to have a lot of bottoming and you're going to be just scraping literally straight line speed off on the ground. Suspension screen number three, roll, the anti-roll bars, front and rear with their stiffness settings. Suspension screen number four, A, I guess we could call this, the dampers, fast and slow bound and rebound rates on all four corners. Suspension screen four, B, these are your third springs in terms of the heave springs. This controls strictly the up and down motion of the chassis. Visuals, we have got the ability to change the color of our steering wheel displays. It defaults to red, but we can also select green, blue, or white, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. And of course, the pit stop strategy screen, nothing changes here from default vanilla Assetto Corsa. So that's all well and good. Setup screen, we do have a few other tools and toys to play with, but for the most part, it's still pretty much par for the course what you would expect to see if you are at all familiar with Aceto Corsa in any respect. However, with that default setup loaded up, let's go into the cockpit here and show you what's what in Formula RSS 2010 V8. Well, first of all, you will notice that we're cold and dark in here. The engine is not running, even though we have got 50 liters of fuel on board. What's going on? Well, these are those Lewis scripts coming to play. And in order to show you more of what's going on here, we need to go into the included RSS extended controls app that you can see right here front and center. This is going to show you how to interface with this car, particularly with the steering wheel and what it can do for you. We've got the ECU here. We have got settings in terms of button assignments. We can change the brightness of our steering wheel display and all of that kind of thing. So it's interesting. However, how do we get this car running? Well, you'll notice here if we go to ECU, we have got ignition assignments for a keyboard button and engine start assignments for a keyboard button and we can even change those assignments if we want. However, if we want to turn the ignition on, it defaults to be the I key on your keyboard. So we're going to hit the I key and the ignition comes on. You can see right now that we have a flashing pit indication there and our speed is in the upper right of the display. And we we only have uh, one line of display, so the right side of the display showing zero because that's our speed right now. Our gear position indicator is front and center showing zero for neutral, and obviously we're in the pit lane, so we've got the flashing pit marker there. We have got lights across the top of the steering wheel. Those are our shift lights and other status lights in terms of flag signals on track, and our neutral light is on as well. That's the green light next to the N button for neutral. 
However, if we go through the different pages on the MFD, and we'll have to be out of the pit lane for you to see these properly, but you will see that we have the ability to change through five different displays that will show us different pieces of information. We can adjust the brightness of the LCD. That's something that you should be able to see here. You can see the light bloom changes depending on what we've got. And the app switching numpad number five will turn the app on and off. Of course, all this on your keyboard as well. So that's really, really cool. So you can change uh, page up and page down assignments, brightness up and down assignments. You can change the brightness of the MFD itself rather than just the lights on the steering wheel. So all sorts of things you can play with really to your heart's content despite this being nowadays a rather simplistic looking steering wheel. However, the other thing that uh, we have to do as the ECU page would suggest is we need to start the engine and we start the engine with the S key on our keyboard. First though, we are going to bring up our display options here so you can see what we're doing via the pedals. Otherwise, we're going to shut everything else off so we don't clutter our screen untowardly. So the ignition is on via the I key. You'll see on our pedal indicator, it shows that I've got the clutch in. I'm not on the clutch, either my pedal or paddles on the back of my steering wheel. The throttle is inactive, the brake is active, obviously. But once we start the engine, watch and listen. So the engine starts, the clutch is now under my control, the brake is still under my control, and now I've got the throttle. So, we now have a live Formula RSS 2010 V8 with 50 liters of fuel on board and one Mugello to ourselves. Let's turn some wheels in it, shall we? Clutch is progressive, but it will bite, so be careful. Now we're out of the pit lane. We can start to change through our screens Lap time here, lap and position here, fuel liter level here in liters, obviously, and water temperature and oil temperature here. Very, very nice. This is showing our speed in kilometers per hour on the left-hand side, gear position in the center, and it will show our live delta on the right-hand side once we have a delta. I have not had the tires in the blanket, so they are cold. So we're just going to be careful bringing them up. Definitely feeling downforce already. But I can certainly feel that those tires are not ready to go yet. But very positive already on the front end. Go down the straight, we'll bring it up to full revs. There we are. And if we press our DRS button, yes, the F duct is engaged, my friends. Now, the way that that F duct works, you press your DRS button, whichever button you have assigned to that function, and the driver's hand will come off of the steering wheel and cover that duct. You can do it at any time. You do not have to be in a DRS zone for it because it's not DRS. And to turn it off, in other words, to stop using the F-Duck, you either press your DRS button again 
or when you get on the brake, it will automatically disengage. The effect of the F duct, it's not quite as pronounced as DRS. Certainly, if you compare this to Formula 2013, the DRS is much more powerful there than the F duct is here. But you do notice it, it does somewhat reduce the rear downforce and it does somewhat increase your straight line speed. So it's a very nice touch. And also a very nice touch you'll see here in seventh gear. No more shift lights because we have no more gears to shift into. I like that. We now have a live delta showing on our steering wheel display. Reading in tenths of a second. Goes down to the hundredths place. And now reading in full seconds. Oh, yep. Oh, yep, she's almost ready. A little squirrely there through the second Arrabiata, but uh, we held it. Very nice. The only thing you can't quite see is your uh, current lap time or your last lap time. You can see where you are currently on your lap time, but you cannot see your best lap or your last lap. I tend to like this display though, uh, showing me my speed and showing me my current lap delta, positive or negative. So we're currently positive on the delta. We've got a green light underneath that right hand window of the display. And almost a second up on our previous session best. Very nice. Little bottoming there through the first one. Confidence lift through the second one. Oh yeah. She's hunkering down now, she wants to go. Little wide there on the exit, but no matter.
yep, that's flat. That wasn't. No, that wasn't. <laughs> oh, but it's tempting me. Yeah, so you can see as the car warms up, you can set personal best after personal best. Now that the car is warmed up here on default setup, there is understeer. Setup is biased initially toward understeer, and that's just for reasons of accessibility, I would presume. However, underneath that understeer is just an enormous amount of grip both mechanically and aerodynamically. I mean, these are fast corners right here. And uh, despite the undulations in the road here creating a little bit of rear instability, it is stuck. It is absolutely stuck to the ground. A little bit of twitchiness in the transitional zones before the speed really ramps up, but that under tray is working almost all the time. And really the difference between medium speed and high speed corners in terms of aerodynamic grip is what the wings are doing rather than the under tray. That under tray is almost always energized, especially because we've got the exhaust going through the diffuser. Brakes are utterly fantastic, as you would expect. They are carbon-carbon. They flare up at high temperature, and then the, uh, the grip that you get, the initial stopping power is immense. Yep, that was flat. <laughs> Gear changes are effectively seamless. No rear locking on the downshifts. Car is fine if you want to shift that part throttle as well. No problem. Those tires are a little off the boil now. Come back into the pit lane, the steering wheel display changes automatically. Punch up neutral, neutral light comes on, and you bring the car to a stop. And then if you want to shut your engine down, you've got two options. One, you can hit the S key again, and that stops the engine but keeps the ignition on. You can also just hit the I key on the keyboard, and that'll stop your engine and shut down everything in the car. Hit that again, and everything comes back on. You cannot start the engine, though, without pressing the I key first. Very, very cool to see things like that. However, uh, coming out of the cockpit there, Back into our free cam here. Yeah, that's what she looks like after our first run. Uh, there are some details that you cannot see from the cockpit, obviously, but the front wing would have been flexing all the time with the aerodynamic and heave loads as we go over the bumps and the curves and things. Same thing with the rear wing. You'd be able to see that flexing in the main plane as well as down here where it joins up with the floor. Very nice. And, of course, uh, particularly through the high-speed corners, the long sweeping corners, you would have seen some flexing going on here with this shark fin. And you'll see some of that in the replays, I am sure. But that's what it does on default setup. Very, very good. Uh, initially, lots of understeer and lots of nervousness on the rear end with cold tires without the tire blankets being used. But uh, once things come up, she is stuck to the ground 
and uh, despite some of, some of the undulations in the road inducing a little bit of rear end instability, it's very confidence inspiring straight out of the box as you've seen. Okay, so that was a lot of fun to get ourselves underway here, but that was just pure default setup, but, you know, fairly light on fuel at 50 liters. However, what starts to happen if we start to play with this thing in terms of the way that I want to set a car up? Obviously, that's the super soft tire. We'll save that for later, so we will actually go with the medium. We will put a bit more fuel on board to simulate what we might get at the start of a race. Let's actually fill it all the way up. 220 liters, but we're going to start on the medium compound. A little bit more downforce or a little bit less downforce? What do we want, actually? I think we could probably get away with a bit less wing. Brake bias felt good. We can probably get away with a bit less brake cooling as well. Open up that differential, though. And then everything else, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, the ride height could go up a bit. Yeah, because we're getting some bottoming, and of course we're going to get more bottoming anyway with the uh, fuel level being the way it is, all that extra weight in the back. Roll bars, uh, make them a little bit more compliant front and rear. Maybe help a little bit with that understeer situation. And I like the red color on the MFD. So we can keep that as it is. So let's see how this gets on. Let's fire her up. All right. Get back out. So we now have a lot of fuel on board. Tires are cold, and they're a bit harder than they were last time. So you can see already, we have a bit of a deficiency in the grip department for the time being. Understeer definitely bottoming already. Tire pressures will come up, of course, as the temperatures come up. Definitely getting wheel spin in third gear as we get back on the throttle. And that wheel spin when the tires are cold that actually can kind of sneak up on you because this engine is making max power so high in the rev range. For most of the rev range, it's actually very flat and then it really peaks as you start to get into the green section of those shift lights around 16 and a half thousand revs or so. You have a little bit more straight line speed. Still trying to work the tires. You work them too hard too soon. You will knock all the new out of them before they've come up to temperature and you will never get peak performance. bit of F-duct action because why not?
So I'd say the brakes are happy now. The tires are mostly happy now. But we are just heavy, very heavy on fuel, as you would expect, obviously, at the start of a race. How is the handling affected? Well, things are just happening a bit more slowly. There's more inertia in the car, particularly laterally as you turn into a corner. It's a bit slower to react. There's more understeer. Of course, a car like this is so simply sprung, you don't really feel body roll per se, but you definitely feel the weight. It's just a little bit slower to respond when it is in those knife edge situations. What you really have to be careful of is the tires when you're running heavy like this because you will really overheat the tires very easily and then you're not gonna have fun because that performance never comes back. No differences though in terms of the response times of the gearbox, both on upshift and downshift. No locking on those downshifts. So that's still absolutely fine. Really feel the weight though in the high speed corners especially. However, just as we did on our prior run, as things come up to temperature and you start to get a better sense of where the car is grip-wise, the time will start to come down and the performance starts to come to you. And that seems to be a general characteristic of how this car does its bidding. It uh, really is a very stable base platform and enables you to understand where it is pretty quickly. And then you build on top of it knowing that there is just a very solid base of performance that's always going to be available no matter what trim you're in. Much better launch into the chicane that time. Can carry it through to the end of the lap. Yep, we sure can. Definitely hear and feel the car bottoming as we're reaching VMAX down the long straight. That's just gonna happen, even though we raise the ride height. But every lap you complete, that's a couple liters less fuel in the tank which means a couple kilos less weight you're carting around, which means a couple thousands of a second, theoretically, per lap faster you can be. 
I'm definitely feeling that these tires have gone through their initial phase. They're starting to lose the outright performance. But they seem to be settling into a nice little area where they're going to be consistent for a while. You can see triggering the F-duct at the wrong moment can unsettle the rear end. Again, it's not reducing a lot of drag, nor is it reducing a lot of rear downforce. But if you're in a situation where you're already utilizing like 99% of the performance available, and then you reduce that margin further, now you might be overstepping the boundaries a little bit. So just be mindful of that. You can trigger that F-duct at any time, so that switch is always live. So just be aware of that. Front tires are a bit hot. Gotta be a little bit nicer to them. Ninety six liters of fuel remaining. Still a little bit of wheel spin in third gear. That's definitely a bit of a scruffy one, but still good enough to be personal best here in this trim. So I'll take it.
and still dealing with that wheel spin in third gear. So just be aware it's a thing that will happen. back into the pits with us here. <laughs> Can cheekily shut the engine down before you've even stopped the car. That's kind of cool. Definitely appreciate things like that, uh, even though it's pointless really, but uh, it makes for some interesting effects in the replays, uh, particularly if you're trying to do any sort of uh, these stupendous ambiance videos that I'll do from time to time if you're trying to recreate what they often do in winter testing, coasting back the last bit with the engine off, you know, little things that you see that add a little bit of a layer of authenticity, I suppose. You're able to do it here because of the way that the uh, Lewis scripts are in terms of emulating the car's ignition system. So that's cool, but you see on the medium compound tires, the middle of the road in terms of what the performance to durability can offer, but very heavy on fuel as well. Again, 220 liters to start. That is not insignificant in terms of weight, but the car still performs pretty nicely. We did a 119.767 on our previous run on default setup. Our run just now has yielded a lap time of 124. 982. So, you know, we're talking five, six seconds between lighter tanks and full tanks, but you would expect to see something like that. So that's in keeping with the performance targets that you could reasonably expect to see in the real world. So again, more points for authenticity and realism, I suppose, for the Race Sim Studio team. Again, this is a fantastically well-designed car, well over a year of development time in it. And again, I think it's the flagship now of the Race Sim Studio Classics line, and there's no expense spared, as I hope you're able to see so far. Of course, though, you know how this has to culminate. Yeah, we've got to go for an all-out hot lap run here in more or less a qualifying trim based on what we were just doing, but we have gotten rid of the medium compound tires and we've now put on the super softs for the first time today. So we've got the stickiest, highest performance tires with the least amount of longevity and durability in them. So we'd better make it count. We have also taken most of the fuel out. So we are running about as light as possible. We've hunkered the ride height down a little bit more. We're trying to trade some downforce top side for downforce bottom side because we don't really care about lasting too long in terms of durability of the car because we're just trying to go as fast as we can. So, in the cockpit with us, let's get this thing fired up and see what we can do here. All right. He thinks we are ready. Let's see what we can do. Of course, still no tire blankets, so we do have to be a little bit mindful of that. But the Super Soft should come up to temperature pretty fast.
that little bit of oversteer settling in there because of cold tires. But the temperatures will be coming up. See what we could do on our first flyer. Bit wide of that apex. It's all right, I gotta give myself some margin to improve on for the next lap, right? Otherwise, I will look awfully silly, as if I don't look awfully silly enough as it is. Oh, yeah! High speed oversteer through uh, one of the fastest corners in the world. That won't make you change the color of your undergarments too quickly. Nor will that! <laughs> okay! You can see that we've got some spicy magic going on on the rear end now. I like a car that's a bit loose in the rear, but there are limits, of course. Not too much more of that, please and thank you. Keep it in, keep it in. Had to lift a little bit. Yep, had to lift a little bit there as well. That was 1.2, almost 1.3 seconds quicker that time round. Whatever the time actually was, I don't know. Feeling some squirreliness on that rear end again. Dual light. Can we keep this flat? Nope. Nope. Not quite. Come on. Go. Losing a bit of time there. Can't afford much more of that. Alright, gain two tenths. Two and a half tenths almost, yep. Don't give too much back. Let's try to stay over three. Yeah, we got it. Okay. <laughs> whatever, whatever that lap time was, that's the max. Because uh, we push uh, for another lap, we're going to run out of gas on the in lap. So this will be the in lap.
not going to look at the lap time until we get back into the pits. I hope that was like uh, in the 17s at least. Otherwise, I'm going to feel awfully silly, but that's where I'm sitting right now. That's what I can do today. So now we're driving it like a Corsica Cliente driver. You know, with like half the revs restricted and braking 997 kilometers before the corner because I'm 75 years old and a business magnate. But here we go. Back into the pits with us. What a fantastic little car this is. <laughs> that cheeky little shutdown. Oh, yes. <laughs> It's so much fun, this thing. And, and I mean, just look at it. Just look at it. And what is that lap time? Please be respectable. Ah, uh, 18.08 to just barely not in the 17s. Uh, I feel stupid now. <sighs> I am stupid. I am stupid, says Charles Leclerc the most famous Monegasque citizen apart from His Serene Highness Prince Albert. However, I digress. All right, we didn't get into the 17s, but what we did there, talking to you all the while, okay, fine, it's somewhat respectable. Some of you are going to absolutely blitz me now that you know what I can do sleep-deprived while trying to hold on to a somewhat cogent verbal thought. But be that as it may, yeah, Formula RSS 2010 V8. It's a car that is really overshadowed by its predecessor chronologically, but its successor in terms of the naming convention, the Formula RSS 2013, definitely gets more press even today, even though, I mean, come on, look at this thing. Everything you see here has been so obsessively crafted by Racim Studios' modeling team. The physics have been obsessively obsessed over for who knows how long and they feel absolutely fantastic. I mean, the fact that I was able to get those sorts of snappy moments at high speed and not spin the car tells you that there is a lot of stuff going on under the skin there in terms of that physics code because, wow, I should have lost it a couple of times there through the Arrabiata corners. But <laughs> you get the visuals, which, which look great. The physics perform wonderfully. I haven't said a word about the sounds because I don't know how to express my approval of these sounds other than... Just, you know, wait until we're doing the hot laps here and just listen to them on board and off board. First of all, if you want to prepare yourself, listen to an on board from the Ferrari F10. There is a video, I think, that's still up of Felipe Massa during a practice session at Silverstone. Just listen to that and then listen to the onboard portion of this audio, and you are hard-pressed to tell the difference. There are some little artifacts that are going to be different here and there, but I mean... If you want authenticity, that's authenticity. And the off-board shots, particularly as this car runs off into the distance and you get the reverberation and when an upshift is hit there and you get the the uh, the wobble, the driveline resonance that comes in as the clutch bangs back in as we're in the next gear up, it's just very, very tasty. So, yeah, you get all of that stuff. But for some reason, it doesn't have the appeal of its predecessor, and I'm not entirely sure why, other than the fact that it is its predecessor. It is the car that came out sooner, and it is the car that looks more like the Red Bull that won the 2013 championship, although I would venture to say that RSS 2013 V8 is more of a ground-up interpretation of a 2010 to 2013 type car than this one is, which is very much more trying to emulate the Ferrari F10 with a few differences here and there, of course. But, yeah, as to why this car still doesn't have the press, I'm partially to blame, I think. I should have done a review of this many months ago. However, 
I've done it here today. I hope I've shown you why I think this is now the flagship of the RSS Classics lineup, even though it is necessarily bumping my beloved Formula 2000 V10 and Formula 1990 V12 from the top spots there, which honestly, I'm still amazed by those two cars. I can drive both of those cars and hit exactly the same lap times, more or less, even though the way that you have to drive them is entirely different. They generate their performance in entirely different ways from each other, but they they net the same result in the end, which is amazing to me. This is on a different planet. It's got more grip. It's got not necessarily more horsepower because the, the V10 car and this one are more or less matched up in terms of horsepower, give or take like 20 or 30 or so. But the downforce is on a different level. This thing will hang with a modern car absolutely unless you're talking about the all-out qualifying trim, in which case the 2023 and 2024 cars are going to be quicker. But it's amazing. It's times faster than the V10 car only because of the tires, really. But, yeah, it's amazing, this thing. And I can't stop gushing about it, but I'm going to force myself to stop gushing about it because there are hot laps to come. The hot laps are actually going to be derived from the run we just did here, so you'll be able to see that from a couple of different perspectives. So I hope you enjoy all of that. Be that as it may, though, that's what I've got for you here today from Mugello in Aceto Corsa, Formula RSS 2010 V8. Better late than never, I would say. I would hate to have to call this car Aceto Corsa's ugly duckling. I was thinking about maybe leading off of the line like that, but I decided against it because there's nothing ugly about this thing. I mean, look at it. If anything, I would say it's a beautiful swan, but then you start to get into swan song. Is it the last car? No, it's not. So <laughs> it's one that I think is a victim of its creator's success. If I could sum it up in a couple of words, that's what I would say. However, enough blabbing from me. Hot laps to come from both trackside as well as onboard views. I'm going to try to show you some of the flexing components as best as I can. Take a look from the F6 cam right here. Take a look uh, at those upper flaps of the front wing when you're in this view and you're going to be able to see the wing bouncing up and down. Uh, we're also going to show you from... This perspective, this rear view camera, you will see the rear wing end fences flexing up and down, and you'll also see the shark fin sort of bowing in and out, depending on whichever direction of the uh, corners we're going through, particularly through the high-speed stuff, Arrabiata in particular. Take a look through there. You will see that vertical line and the livery deflecting a bit, and the reflection will also deflect a bit. So that's really, really cool. But be that as it may, that's what I've got for you here today. Stay tuned for the hot laps, everyone. F-Man saying thank you very, very much for watching. Thank you very, very much to Race Sim Studio for bringing, the, bringing us this wonderful car. I'm sorry that I neglected to review it for months. But here it is, and yes, it's wonderful, and I still love it all the same. Stay tuned for the hot laps. f man saying thank you very much, and of course, we will see you soon.